Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Character Day 2016 um, and our uh, first early morning broadcast on Character Day itself. We started the program uh, last night, but we are in full, um, full run this morning and we'll be starting out uh, talking to Julie Lifcott Hames, um, a former dean of freshman students at Stanford. Is that right? Right. And um, Julie has was a um, was a dean there for uh, I think over a decade, and when she finished, she left there to pursue an MFA in creative writing. And along that way, I'm guessing must have also been a parent because she wrote uh, an amazing book about how to raise called How to Raise an Adult. And um, so Julie's here to talk to us a little bit uh, today about um, how we can work on some of the character strengths that we've talked about in different contexts in Character Day. Um, uh, and I imagine specifically in regards to bringing up your children with some of these character traits. So Julie, can you start out by telling us a little bit about your background um, and how it led to some of your thinking about parenting, especially with the amount of incoming freshmen I imagine you must have seen at Stanford and the kind of state of mind they were. And I know when I was a freshman, you know, a lot of things that were left over from my my parenting and my raising up were sort of came to the fore as I as I entered into college and was away from home for the first time. Yeah, well, wow, that's that's a lot. Here we are in Pacific time at seven o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to have another sip of coffee. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, I've been a lawyer, I've been a university dean, and now I'm uh, making my way in the world as a writer. But I think a, the thread weaving through those seemingly very different professional um, lives is that um, I care about humans as many of us do and what I've learned over the years from working closely with humans is we all want to know we matter we all are desperately hungry to know that we matter and we can show one another that we matter through the way we behave so um, big picture here you know mattering connecting meaningfully to other humans is so much not about our title, our degree, our station in life, and so much more about our ability to show up in the lives of other humans with a good character, uh, to be kind, um, uh, to look someone in the eye, um, to be respectful, and all and the various, various, various come under the chair, but the dean. Becoming their adult selves, and um, in my view, their character development was far more important than something like their GPA. And um, how do you? Uh, I know as a you know when you're parenting, I also have uh, I have two young kids, four and six, and um, you know wanting them to have character traits and um, creating an environment where those character traits can emerge are two different things. Can you talk a little bit about how you can? Um, sort of get out of the way in some ways to let the, your children develop those things and sort of, sort of telling them you need to have grit and strength and resilience. Yeah, well, number one, well, the first thing I should say is um, I didn't set out to be a parenting expert and I don't actually consider myself one. I wrote this book on parenting. We used to call it child rearing, Arnie. We used to put children at the center of it, but now we're parenting like it's about us. I say that because I want to start there. When you're raising a young human, it's not about you. We have the privilege of getting to be alongside a young human growing. And so this shift right away to respect the individual that they are, to remember that we are a separate being, that's kind of step number one. Step number two is be a good role model for character. You can't teach your kid grit and resilience, which are buzzwords flying off the tongues of educators and psychologists these days. You can't just make someone gritty <laughs> or you know, give someone the lesson of resilience. Those traits are developed by living life. They're best developed when life doesn't always go easily. That's how a human picks themselves, you know, when, when a human picks himself back up from a difficult situation or perseveres through it, you know, that's how over time grit is developed and resilience. So as parents, instead of just talking the talk, we got to walk the walk. We have to let our kids see that sometimes we too have struggled 
The psychologist Madeline Levine here in, in Marin County tells us parents that our kids think we've we've led a trajectory that's just gone from here to here or here to here, whichever way the camera is working for me here. You know, like our lives have been this upward trajectory. <laughs> Right? Our kids think that. They don't know that our lives have also done this or had some you know, dips and whatnot. When we can share with our kids our vulnerability, that we're not perfect, that we have struggled, and role model for them how you cope with it, that's really how we can inspire them um, to want to develop the character traits that will lead to their long-term grit and resilience. And what, what in your mind are those, I think you have a, a checklist of, um, of life skills. Can you talk a little bit about that, um, about that checklist and what, what it's there for and how it can be useful? Well, yeah, you know, so here I am, I'm a dean, I was a dean, left Stanford in 2012, um, looking, wor working with young adults and seeing them so accomplished in a resume and transcript sense, but, um, but so unfamiliar with their own selves or with the life skills they might need um, if they were disconnected from um, their parents for two or three days. Um, and so I came up with a different checklist um, and it's playing on the, the term that I've coined, the checklist of childhood, which is what many kids lead these days. So you gotta be able to talk to strangers uh, when you're 18. You gotta be able to find your way around your new town or campus. And that doesn't mean ask your parents how to find your way around. It means figure it out with an app or a map or God forbid, talking to strangers and asking for help. Um, you gotta be able to manage your own assignments and workload and deadlines. You gotta be able to contribute to the running of a household. You gotta be able to handle interpersonal problems, cope with the ups and downs of life, earn and manage money and take risks. And um, when I think about what links these you know, eight um, items together, these eight traits or skills, um, our, their ability to look beyond their own self and engage the environment around them, the humans around them, the systems around them, um, requires a willingness to be respectful toward others and to advocate for your own needs. And I think uh, my two teenagers are 15 and 17, and when they leave my home and go out into the world, you know, bottom line, I want them to be able to treat other humans with respect, by which I mean kindness and generosity and gratitude, look people in the eye, be kind, and, and know how to advocate for their own needs, know how to ask for help, ask for permission, ask for guidance, ask for forgiveness. You know, they need to be able to both be very interested in kindness toward others and be able to advocate for themselves. Now you, when you're a parent, and I'm sure you, you know, were on this bridge at some point as a parent too, that you're, I, I was interested that you brought up this idea that it's, you know, ch parenting versus child rearing, because I think that people expect parenting, and I've certainly put myself in this category, to be deeply satisfying on some level, that you're getting this great experience out of being around your kids, and, and that that kind of leads to it feels really good in the moment to run to your child when they're crying and give them a big hug or um, to help them do something or give them what it was they wanted. Um, can you talk a little bit about navigating that line between where, where you get your joy from maybe not the immediate, but from understanding or knowing that you're, you're creating this environment where your kid, your human is, is evolving rather than um, just enjoying these like moments of, I, I gave him just what he wanted or, and he was so happy. Well, it's such, you're asking great and complex questions and I'm turning around because I wanted to pull up other people's books. When you started talking, Jennifer Senior's book, All Joy and No Fun came to mind. The Paradox of Modern Parenthood, All Joy and No Fun. Yeah, a lot of people are feeling that way. And then Bridget Schulte's Overwhelmed, Work, Love and Play When No One Has the Time. Um, we've become, this is not my original language. People have said we are <coughs> we are human doings, doings these days instead of human beings. And we seem so interested in our kids um, going to the right school, having the right activity, uh, making sure their play is well supervised and every, you know, and we've, we've lost sight of the fact that, um, that humans develop in the silences 
as much as we do in the activity and the frenzy. And um, we've lost sight of the fact that we parents have to be not only good role models for grit and resilience, but for having a life. You know, we, many of us, and, and this is, you know, what I'm speaking to right now is certainly a situation in privileged communities where parents have time and money to kind of do this stuff, but it's like, we're always there attending kids' activities. Um, here in the US, this is a huge thing. Um, we're always there, we're always just on the sidelines of their lives. Instead of sharing with them what brings us joy in our own lives, we behave as if our kids are our project. Um, and and so then it's all about them. And, and um, instead what we ought to be doing is recognizing that having children is a critical part of our life, but we also have other things going on. We have a loving relationship, maybe with a spouse or a partner. We have hobbies, we have friendship, we have work or volunteer work that matters to us. And again, it comes back to um, not turning our children's life into this project that we have to micromanage, but instead delighting um, in the things that they do and in the things that we do, looking our kid in the eye and being able to say, you know, I see you for who you are, you know, and I like what I see. How can I help you become the self you dream to be? Wonderful. And I, you know, I'm, I can't help thinking when you're talking about, you know, this image of being on the sidelines of our children's lives that, um, that technology has added this whole new way to sort of be accompanying our to like we're Facebook friends with our kids and, how, how do we interact with them or how do we understand what's happening to them digitally um, as parents? And I think, um, you know, technology, like you think of a job, like, ah, oh, my cell phone is liberating in some ways, but it's also imprisoning in a way because your work can reach you wherever you are. Um, how, how, does that, how does that get into this, this area that you've talked about where growing happens in space? Technology doesn't allow a lot of silence and a lot of space for either between parents or for kids uh, on their own. Well, I'm struggling with this like any parent. There's a book that I can't find right now on my shelf. It's called Media Moms and Digital Dads. And it's out this past year from uh, Yalda Ulis. Um, you know, she, Yalda talks about how technology is here to stay and we've got to kind of figure out how to let it become a part of our life instead of take over our life. I know Tiffany Schlain, who's uh, created Character Day, has a technology Shabbat in her family where from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, everyone in the family disconnects from technology. And when she says that to audiences, people gasp either audibly or you could just see it in their faces thinking, I could never pull that off in my family. And those of us with teenagers, I think we feel a bit you know, less empowered if we haven't, if we haven't had kind of a strong ideals-based approach thus far. It's hard to impose that on teenagers, not in any sense impossible. Um, I guess what I'm saying is um, we have to claim the authority we have in our own lives. Uh, technology is doing all kinds of wonderful things to empower us and um, aid us. But, um, but yeah, I'm worried about the extent to which um, my kids are looking at screens for pleasure and for connection and for solutions instead of looking into the eyes of other humans. I think, Arnie, we don't yet know. The studies have not yet been done on what will a generation of humans raised without eye contact, relatively speaking, what will they be like? What will they become? Who will they become? And how will we all change accordingly? I think that's going to be a huge awakening <coughs> next 10 or 15 years you know, how can we reclaim this essential connection? You know, infants need this eye contact with with loving um, grown-ups, parents or otherwise, to thrive. You know, so um, we ought to all be interested in, um, in making sure that even as technology surrounds us and enables us and aids us, that um, we don't lose track of what makes us uniquely human, um, which is... You know, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist or a biologist, but it feels to me and through the work of others, you know, I know that this connection that we can make, this is why this Google Hangout is hard or Skype. It's like, I can't look you in the eye right now, you know, 
we can't, we're both looking at our cameras if we're looking each other in the eye. And um, I'm interested in what that, what that's doing to us and how we can be better at bringing technology to the place of actual eye contact. I'm curious also what this does with parenting because I'm thinking about when I was a kid and let's say I was at a friend's house and I needed a ride home uh, where we were out and about. I mean, there was no way I had to think of another solution. You know, I didn't have a phone with me to like, oh, I can get picked up by my mom or I can be taken care of in any situation wherever I am. You know, there were many situations as a teenager, especially where I was like, I had to come up with a solution. Like, how am I going to get on this bus? I didn't realize I had enough money. I did, you know, I didn't have enough money for the bus, et cetera. I, there, there's also that side too, where the kids, the kids are locked in, but parents are kind of locked in in a way as well. So I think here we have to balance convenience with um, skill building. You know, nowadays in communities where Lyft and Uber and other car sharing services are present, it's easy for us to send our kid from here to there by just calling one of these car share services via our phone. And yet we want to know our kids can figure out how to get from here to there when their phone has died or when we're not around to help. Um, so I think in when we're faced with that dilemma, we have to actually put opportunities for our kids' skill development in their way. Um, childhood is, if it's technology laden, um, and urban with an infrastructure around, you know, parental help and so on, you know, they, they might not, they might be able to get through life, never having to get on a bus, never having to walk anywhere, never having to pick up the phone and make a phone call. Um, and I think therefore, uh, we, since we know that life will not always be that way, that they will find themselves in unfamiliar places and we want them to have some confidence that they can design their way out of that problem rather than to shut down and be bewildered and frightened because they've never been in that circumstance. So for example, I, I've encouraged my two kids at relatively young age, 12, um, which these days seems young, I think, to get on the train, you know, the Cal train that, that stops here in my town and heads up to your town, you know, in San Francisco, or, um, and, uh, you know, to use the public transportation and, you know, to go to a bus stop and figure out which bus you want to get on and go up to the mall up the street. And, you know, could I drive them? Yes. But I want them to know that trains and buses and other modes of transportation, you know, exist <coughs> around the world. And a human who's going to be able to kind of land in a strange place and make their way has to know how to get on a bus and a train and not just rely on some app, you know, to kind of magically deliver a vehicle to them. Um, how do we, <clears throat> how do we, or do you see their hope for pushing that needle back and with technology and and just the sort of style of parenting that you that you um, track in your book that's sort of overgrown everything. How do we push the needle back and can we? Well, we have to, and here's why. I'm just trying to find my book because I don't have this memorized. Um, <laughs> the mental health and wellness of our children is in jeopardy. Um, the the uh, college and university campus mental health clinics are seeing alarming rates um, of anxiety and depression and other disorders in childhood. We're seeing that as well in communities all over the United States. Um, and recently studies have begun to link this hovering parenting style, this over-involved parenting that I write about, which is being very overprotective or being very insistent upon a particular direction. The kid does everything a certain way or holding our kids' hands too long, like we're their concierge, you know, like how can I make your life easier, kid? Um, studies are linking this over-involved parenting style with higher rates of anxiety and depression and even with a um, lower degree of executive function. So um, as these data become more clear, and as parents wake up to that fact and see what's going on in their own kids' bodies and minds and see what's happening in their neighborhoods around mental health, I think mental health is the big wake-up call. However badly you think you want to steer your kid down a particular path, drag them down it, hold them by the hand, do it for them. They are harmed when that happens. Whatever success you have in mind is far less important than the wellness you want them to have out in life. You know, you want your kid to make it out of your home and out of your school district, knowing how to work hard, knowing how to treat others with kindness and with their mental health intact. And, you know, stepping back a little bit and letting your young human work on these traits of 
kindness to others, being responsible, being accountable for their own stuff, rolling up their sleeves, pitching in, helping out around the house. Chores turn out to be a huge predictor for, for, for professional success. You know, this is a foundational thing that we can offer our kids. It's so much more important than this um, obsession many of us have with um, their academic, um, you know, their GPA. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, this has been really, really wonderful. Are we done? Oh, my gosh. What? <laughs> I said, are we done? Oh my gosh, yeah, time flew. Yeah, time flew. And thank you so much. As a parent, this was a very uh, encouraging and exciting conversation to have. Um, can you uh, just briefly tell everybody more about where they can learn more about your work? And um, maybe, uh, I'm sure, imagine your book is available at Amazon and everywhere you can buy books. It sure is. Thank you for that opportunity. Here's the book. It's called How to Raise an Adult. It's on. It's at local bookstores. It's on Amazon. There's a, a Kindle, you know, an ebook version, an audio book version. I just did a TED Talk, actually. It came out last week. So if you go to TED.com, you can find my talk. Um, yeah, so check me out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, How to Raise an Adult. You can find me there. My website is HowToRaiseAnAdult.com. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Julie. Thanks for having me, Arnie, and Character Day. Yay. Woo Bye.